Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Din and Daf. I'm your host, Alana Steinhain, and this is where we conceptualize halacha based on the Daf. Our Din and Daf this week is probably accompanying you on your many Pesach errands. Could be that you are cleaning for Pesach. Could be that you are cooking for Pesach. Could be that you are traveling for Pesach. Could be that you are buying Yom Tov clothes for Pesach. So let's go with this last one of buying Yom Tov clothes for Pesach, and we are going to deal with the issue of Ona'at Mamon this week. Ona'at Mamon, spoken about extensively in the fourth paragraph of Bab Metziah, um, alongside Ona'at Dvarim, which we will see next week and talk about more next week. But Ona'at Mamon is overcharging or undercharging. Overcharging or undercharging for a um, an item that is portable. What's so interesting about Ona'at Mamon, there's a lot that's very interesting about Ona'at Mamon. Quite frankly, I actually love that we're trying to protect the consumer with the overcharging problem, and we're trying to um, protect the seller with the undercharging problem. But what's so interesting about Ona'a that we don't talk so much about is that there's real discrepancies between the way that the Mishnah describes and the Gemara describes Ona'a and the way that the Torah and the Tanakh use the term. So something that we should know to start with is that Ona'a comes from the root Yud Nun He, which means to oppress. And it's interesting because it seems like from Chazal, certainly Ona'at Dvarim, uh, there are versions of oppression with words, um, which we'll probably see examples of next week, where you say to somebody, oh, you used to be a sinner and now you're not. But it's interesting to consider overcharging someone to be a form of oppression. All right, so I just want us to keep that in mind because some of the discrepancies between the way that the Chumash describes Ona'a and the way that Chazal described Ona'a, it sounds like for Chazal, Ona'a is fraud, right? It is fraud. Whereas, as we will see in the Chumash and in Tanakh, it seems to be oppression, and we'll get to that. So let's just point out a few of the differences between the way Ona'a is spoken about in Chazal and the way that Ona'a is spoken about in the Torah. Because I think anytime you find disparity, there is uh, room for creativity. There's room for trying to mind the gap and narrow the gap between them and find out new dimensions and exciting dimensions about this halacha and about this concept. So we find out in the Mishnah of Bama that uh, Perak Dalid, Mishnah Gimel, Ha'ona'a arba'a uh, kesef me'as srim arba'a kesef lasela. Right, so ona is overcharging or underpaying by a sixth. Okay, so that's first of all we don't find in the chumash an explanation of how much is ona overpaying or underpaying. And a second is even the next line in the mishnah of armatay mutar lachzir, for how long can the consumer decide to cancel the uh, the purchase? when they are overcharged by more than a sixth, right? So interestingly enough, we also don't see that ramification of being able to pay back. So I actually want to go through the psukim for a minute about Ona'a, which are the makor, which are the source for Ona in the Torah. And I'm very excited. You're going to hear me talking about my kids' bar mitzvah a lot over the next few weeks because Bezrat Hashem, it is Parshat Bahar. Um, which is Lag Ba'omer, Lev Ba'omer uh, weekend. Um, and in Vayikra, that is where we find the uh, psukim about Ona'at Ma'mon. And I just want to wish everybody a bracha here that they should be, um, they should merit being able to start a pasuk that someone in their family is learning how to lane and have them finish the end of the pasuk, which is what happened with me with my son this week and nothing could make me, well, I'm sure other things could make me equally happy, but that was a pretty high point. So, it is in the realm of Yovel, okay? Talking about selling land, knowing that the land is not going to be sold forever because it will be returned at Yovel time. When you sell something to a neighbor, Presumably, we are talking about property, and we'll see why. Meaning, presumably, we're talking about landed property, and we'll see why in a minute. Oh, kanom yadamitecha, or you buy something 
from your fellow. Al tonu ish etachi. Do not, and I'm just going to use the translation of do not oppress each other because that is the shoresh of the word, at least biblically, at least tanachically. So how are you going to make sure not to oppress each other? Bimispar shanim achar hayovel tiknem eit amitecha. Right? So when you're doing this purchasing, right, what you have to do is you're going to figure out the purchase price on the basis of how many years after the Yovel year it's been purchased. And that person is going to be mispar yim korlach. They're going to sell to you based on how many years of tvua, how many years of crops will you be able to get before you have to return it to them in the Yovel year, right? So essentially what we're doing is the purchase price is set by how many years you have left with this land to be able to work it. It sounds like the definition of al tonu ish et achiv is make sure that you are setting the purchase price based on how much time the buyer has left with this land before they have to give it back at the next Yovel. And then the next passage spells it out. If there's more years left, you can pay the you can make the price higher. And if there are fewer years left until the Yovel, it should be a lower price. Right? What has to be sold to you is basically the number of harvests that are remaining. And then we have a generalized pasuk that Chazal are going to interpret as onaat dvarim, oppression with words, which you'll hear about next week because it's not just oppression with words, it's also giving misdirections or misimpressions. But lo tonu ishet amito, you should not oppress each other, viareta me'elokecha, you should fear God, because I am Hashem, your God. What's so interesting about this example is that it is clearly about land. We are talking about deducting the number of years that are from the Jubilee, making the making the price, setting the price based on how long you can work the land for. It's clearly, clearly, clearly about land. And it seems to be you have to set the right price. And yet the Mishnah and Baba Metziah, Perek, Dalit, Mishnah, Tet, which I think you're going to get to Next week, I think. These are things where you cannot, we do not apply the fraud issue if you get overcharged. We don't consider it an overcharge legally. Ha'avadim, slaves, sad, thank God that's not our issue anymore. Hashtarot, bills of debt. Ha'vehakarkaot, and property, land, landed property, right? Via hektesh and things that have been given to hektesh, things that have been consecrated. I want to focus, laser focus in on karkaot. Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. You're telling me that the Torah itself, by Yikra Cafe, is describing in the Jubilee year how you should charge a certain amount based on the years that you have left to work the land, and it's all about land. And then when you get to Chazal, they say, ah, Ona'a doesn't apply to land. It only applies to metaltalin. It only applies to portable things. So what, what's 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 going on here? So I find this to be a really interesting question because it's not just by, you know, like there's one exception. It's the entire makor, the entire source for onat mamon comes from a passage that is about land. And yet Chazal say it does not apply uh, to land. Why? Because o kano miyad amitecha, Literally, not you're buying something from someone, it's you're literally buying it from their hand, something that can be taken from hand to hand, okay? So I want to understand what is this discrepancy about? How do we bridge the gap? What are we supposed to do here? And I have three answers for you, and I think each of these answers highlights, first of all, I think a different way of thinking about the role of Chazal as interpreters of Chumash. And I also think that each, each um, explanation or resolution highlights a different aspect of Ona, and I think it's really worth thinking about, okay?
First thing, I just want to tell you, I want to give you one more piece of background. Uh, actually, should we do that yet? No, nah, let's not do that. We're going to get back to it. So first of all, the Ramban notices, Ramban al Torah notices, and I just gave you an excerpt from it in a longer Ramban. He notices this discrepancy, right? He says, like, how could this be that the Torah says there's no Ona on Karka, on land, when the whole Mokra and the Chumash is about land, right? So he says, Vani Hoshev od Svara. He says, this is what I think. Shevadai hamanet chavero ladat. For sure, a person who defrauds another person purposely, meaning overcharges them a six, over belav, they have violated a lo shabbat Torah. They have violated a negative commandment. Whether we're talking about portable items or we're talking about land. Why? That is what the Torah is talking about when it says a person should not uh, a person should not defraud their fellow, or as we defined it, oppress. We'll get back to it. Right? That's the whole point. The whole azhara here is that you should be making the sale, buying or selling based on the number of years that are left until the next yovel or that have elapsed since the previous yovel. And they shouldn't oppress each other. Aval. Okay, so it's clear that from the Torah itself, it's a law, it's a lot to say, whether it's with metal to and portable things or with karka, right? So what about Chazal saying, oh, no, it doesn't apply to karka? He says, well, aval, rabotenu chitshu ba'ona'ah, tashlumim b'shtot ha-mekach. U bitol ha-mekach b'yoter So he says, but what were the rabbis um, innovating in terms of the distinction between metaltalin, between portable items and karka, when it comes to metaltalin, that's the only place where if a, a seller overcharged a sixth, they have to give that sixth back, right? There's a tashlumin requirement. There's a compensation requirement. And also that if they charge more than a sixth, it's only with metaltalin that the buyer can say, this is void or that it is automatically void unless the buyer waives their rights, which is a whole different conversation, right? And it's only from this, the tashlumen issue and the voiding of the um, transaction, it's only in those situations or it's only for that application that miatu karkaot, that they excluded land from that. That's the only place that they excluded land from, right? Because when it comes to Ona regarding them, even if you overcharge more, people are willing to waive their rights for it when it comes to karka. Just like if you overcharged with metaltalin less than a six, we just assume that people waive their rights to that, right? AFLP, even, even though she asur lo honot, she asur lo honot even though you're really prohibited from doing that on purpose, right? Just like you shouldn't be charging less than a six more on purpose, you also shouldn't be charging a sixth more on karka on purpose. But do you have to repay? No. Do we void the transaction? No. Okay. Aval ein derech b'nei adam levatel mem karam ipnei onaamu etet kazo. Right? You shouldn't be charging even a sixth, less than a sixth more on metaltalin. But nobody would cancel a transaction for that little amount. V'darshu chachamim and the rabbis interpreted mipnei she'amara katuv. Because the Pasuk says, um, because the Pasuk says, when you sell something to your fellow, oh, kano, or you buy it, remember it says, miyad, right? Miyad amitecha. Right? That's 
only things that are can be bought literally from hand to hand, otherwise known as mitaltalin. In those situations, altonu ishdachiv, you shouldn't be oppressing each other by defrauding with the uh, amount. So that teaches us that there's a special din regarding ona when it comes to portables. That doesn't apply with karka. And that is returning the money. But the warning that you're not allowed to do it, that it's a lotase, applies to both metaltalin and karkaot. And that's why the Pasuk starts, and I think this is so interesting what he's about to do. Starts, the Pasuk starts with, and when you, plural, sell something, that's in Lashon Rabin. It's plural. Why? It's including both a person who's selling land and a person who's selling portables. But then, guess what? becomes a singular. Now, I think I think I would say I'm going to do this a little bit slowly. I think he's saying kano is a singular verb. Now, I don't know. I'm not, this is where I'm not being a Hebrew linguist. I'm not sure that everybody would say that that implies the singular or if it implies some like gerund, like a verb form of selling. If you're a linguist, you'll tell me, right? Meaning, but he says it's implying the singular of kano. It's only a single person, meaning only the person who's selling metaltalin. And then at the end, again, in the last Pasuk, in Pasuk Yitzayin, we have altonu in the plural, right? You shouldn't defraud or you shouldn't oppress. And because the Pasuk put o kano mi'ana is something o kano for chazal, because it was miyad, puts it in the singular and 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 points it out as metaltalin, Therefore, it teaches us there's something special about the din of metaltalin. Basic ona lotase is for everything, for karka and metaltalin, but the din of having to return the money, or in a case of more than a shtut, more than a sixth, to cancel the transaction, that is only for metaltalin. Right? So that's the Ramban. What I think is so great about the Ramban is the way that he is um, bridging the gap, is he's trying to say, you know, don't try to get away with everything. He compares overcharging by a sixth on karka to overcharging by less than a sixth on metaltalin. He doesn't want you doing that either. He doesn't want you doing that either. Now, I don't know how you're supposed to make a profit. That's a different conversation. <laughs> you know, like that, that's that's not my issue right now. But what I will say is that I think it's intriguing for him to say, look, there can be a difference between saying that something is usser and saying that you have certain consequences if you do them meaning very concrete consequences of compensation. And I think too often we look at um, criminality as, you know, not, is this a sur la sot? Is this prohibited? Is this the wrong thing to do? But what are the consequences going to be if I do it? And here he's distinguishing and saying, yeah, you're right. There's no concrete consequences that I'm going to give you. Aside from the fact, if you do ona with karka, aside from the fact that, you did something wrong and that should matter, right? So I think that's interesting in and of itself. And it sort of highlights an aspect of halachic thinking of it's not always just about the consequence. Sometimes it's about you just did something wrong. So that's one read. Here is a second read, which I find really interesting. And this comes from a more academic background. These two um, scholars, Ben Sion Rosenfeld and um, Joseph Menirav, Yosef Menirav probably, they actually said, well, actually, we want to think for a minute about what the difference might have been in the way that Karka was sold and understood market prices around Karka in biblical times 
versus what how are market prices understood or how is um just the the financial issues around karka in the time of Chazal, how does that differ? And for that, you know, I said to you before, I wanted to look back at the Tosefta. I want to look back at the Tosefta for a second because the Mishnah that we saw that said that there's no Ona on Karka also, by the way, had an opinion of Rabbi Yehuda. You can always count on Rabbi Yehuda to bring in something colorful. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Afam Ulcher Sefer Torah, right? There's no Ona if you overcharge for the sale of a Sefer Torah or for a behima, or for an animal, or a margalit, or a pearl. Now, Chachamim don't agree with him, but that's his opinion. Now, in the Tosefta, which just to remind everybody is a companion piece to the Mishnah, it is anthologized, meaning it's like put together probably, you know, 25, 30 years after the Mishnah, but it often has materials that's from earlier, and sometimes it says things in a different way than the Mishnah. So Rabbi Yehuda's opinion in the Tosefta gives you actually a reason why he thinks there's no ona on these things. So Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Sefer Torah, Behemu, Margalit, Ein Lahem Ona'a. If it's a Sefer Torah that you're overcharging for, or an animal, or a pearl, there's no such thing as Ona on them. Sefer Torah, why Mipneshe, Ein Lodamim. When you talk about a Sefer Torah, a Sefer Torah is priceless. Behema Margalit, the animal and the pearl, Mipneshe, Rotzel is Afghan, right? Because people actually want to pair them with their counterpart, right? I have another animal that I want to pair with this one in order to do harisha, in order to do my plowing, or in order to pull my cart, whatever it is, right? So I'm willing to pay extra. I, I want to find, or a pearl, I want to match it up to the other thing. You know, for me, I would say for earrings to be able to have not just one pearl, but to have two pearls, right? So I'm looking, Liz of Go, right? And Chachamim say to him, Amr Go. We could actually say there are lots of different things. Anything you could argue, somebody's looking to match it up with something else. Why those things? So Rabbi Yehuda ben Betera Omer, and then we see Rabbi Yehuda ben Betera says, who some people say it should mean ben Petera, okay? He says, Hasus v'asayif b'milchama e'en lahem ona'a. He says, by the way, I also want to tell you that a horse, a battle axe, and a good sword in a time of war, they are also not subject to the laws of ona'a. Probably because supply and demand you would pay anything for them. You really, really need them in those times. But suffice to say, what this Tosefta does is it gives a little bit of color as to why you might say that something is not um, subject to the laws of Ona'a. So in this situation, it's a person would be willing to pay more because they really need it. They really want it. Or it's a safer Torah and it's priceless. Or they want to be able to match it up with something else. And so there, and therefore, there's you know a different kind of urgency around it. So these two scholars, Rosenfeld and Mini Rav, they were asking themselves, you know, is it possible that the way that things are done in the biblical period in terms of selling karka is a little different than the way that things are done in the rabbinic period in terms of selling karka? Just differences in their economic systems. So this is what they suggest. The difference in positions may be explained as arising from a difference in historical circumstances. The biblical position, which sounds like Ona'a applies to karka, arose within a tribal and conservative society where personal real estate was the property uh, of an individual, but considered as part of the possessions of the family or the tribe. This meant that steps were taken to ensure that the land would remain in this framework and would not be sold. Consequently, the sale of land was less widespread and its value was less likely to be more stable, was, was likely to be more stable, sorry. Meaning you're not selling land to and fro. It's supposed to stay within your clan. It's supposed to stay within your tribe. And to be honest, the market value is probably set in a much more stable way. So yes, there's such a thing as, I know the overcharge of more than a sixth because it's such a stable market price, right? The Tanakh also pins its price to the Jubilee, to the Yovel, and the number expected of expected harvests of the field to be sold on the understanding that the sale of land is not permanent. The land is to be returned to its original owners at the Jubilee. This idea is the project, the product of the tribal de determination to preserve tribal possessions as one of the means by which tribal agricultural society maintained its internal stability. So meaning less likely to sell land, more likely to have a clear market price, thus more likely for Onad to apply. The sages, on the other hand, were active in an entirely different period in which tribalism did not feature. They lived within the structure of the Roman Empire, whose communications and commercial methods were far more advanced than those of previous societies. 
In a world where commerce was relatively freer and more developed, an individual in Palestine was much less, in, uh, much less dependent on a restrictive tribal society. For this reason, the sale of land was far more widespread. For this reason, it seems, and of course this is speculative, but I think it's interesting, the sages treated land as a unique item, just like a pearl and a Torah scroll, having no fixed worth and whose price varies in each specific case. The world of the sages was agricultural and land was a central possession in the Jewish economy in Palestine in the Roman period, just as it was in broader Roman society. Accordingly, sages assumed that someone about to sell his land would examine the transaction carefully and would not be defrauded, right? So it's interesting. It seems that they're saying two different things. One is they're essentially saying it could be that market price is not so clear and it's considered something where the price is going to value, it is going to fluctuate in situation to situation. And then they add this other line of people are going to be very careful not to be defrauded. I'm not even sure that they need that last line, but suffice it to say what they're trying to suggest is that it really is possible that the logic that's suggested in the time of the Tanakh that you would need to make sure that Ona is not done on Karka. There's a set price, and if you do more than a sixth, or if you do a sixth extra, there should be consequences to it. It might be that in the time of Chazal, that that actually doesn't really track. Like it doesn't really make as much sense to them to apply to karka because karka is not something where the price is so clearly set it's something different it's a different kind of situation where it fluctuates in situation to situation here too i find it really interesting because whenever we are talking about uh issues of finance and economics you know that things are going to change and the question is how do you understand the logic behind some of these changes. How do you make sure that you're trying to have a fair society that isn't hampering what we might call regular business practices, right? This is kind of the opposite of the Ramban because the Ramban was saying, no, 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 there's still Ona and Karka. We still don't want you to do it. You just don't have to return the one sixth or you just don't have to cancel the transaction if it's more than that. These scholars are suggesting Actually, it's possible that in the time of Chazal, it doesn't make a lot of sense to apply Ona to Karka itself. So this is a second, um, a second approach. I want to give the third and last approach, which I think is actually a very nice way to bring us into Pesach. The third and last approach is what I would call a Rashbam approach. A Rashbam approach to reading the Torah is the Torah might say one thing, Chazal may say something else. And you have to figure out how to compartmentalize in your head. The pshat can be one thing. The drash can be something else. And so there are scholars who suggest, wait a minute. When I look at what the word ona'a means in Tanakh, it does not mean defraud. It does not mean defraud. It means oppress. And consistently, it is about a stronger party oppressing a weaker party. And so shmot kaf bet kaf, for example, you should not oppress a stranger, meaning somebody who was with B'nai Israel but wasn't of B'nai Israel, right? Um, what we would call a ger toshav, and you shouldn't oppress them. Don't oppress them and don't oppress them. Because you were gerim in Egypt. Now, I want to just point out, this is not a financial pasuk. It's a pasuk you shouldn't oppress them. You're stronger. They're somewhat of the outsider or the marginal figure. You shouldn't oppress them. Yechezkel also. Here it seems to be about finances, but again, it's about the stronger oppressing the weaker. The ish lo yomne, a person will not be considered one who's oppressed, who has oppressed another, if chavolato chov yashiv gzela lo yigzol. If someone's returned the pledge of the debtor, and hasn't stolen anything. If one has given bread to the hungry, and has uh, covered the naked with clothing, right? How do you make sure you don't oppress? You find those who are weak, who may be a debtor, who may be hungry, who may lack clothing, and you help them. 
Una'a, and I and I gave you a list of other sukim in Tanakh that you can look at throughout Tanakh, where Una'a is not about defrauding. It's about the stronger party mistreating the weaker party and oppressing the weaker party. And it is possible with like a Rashbam lens that actually our Pasuk back in that says, when you are buying something or you are, when you are, excuse me, selling something or you are buying something, you shouldn't oppress that actually what that might mean is not necessarily about fixing prices, right? Or maybe it is about fixing prices, but actually what it's really about perhaps is being oppressive in the way that you do this business, right? So for example, you might overcharge someone for this piece of land. That might be one way to oppress them. But another way to oppress them is to buy the land and keep it forever, right? Actually, in some ways, maybe the seller is the weaker party. And you buying the land from them and saying, I'm going to keep it forever. That's really the problem. And instead, the psukim are telling you, no, no, no. What you need to do is you need to only buy it for a certain, a certain amount of time, right? You notice it very much focuses on both buyer and seller. Oh, one second. Sorry, I just lost something for a minute. I first saw this explanation from an article in a journal called Beit Mikra by uh, somebody named Abraham Ahuvia, where he suggested, you know, instead of kind of the way that we look at it in the Gemara, where the salesperson is the stronger one and the person, the consumer is the weaker one, and the salesperson shouldn't overcharge the weaker person who's the buyer. What if you look at it, shot of the psukim, that actually the person who is in trouble here is the one who has to sell their land because they clearly need money, and that's why they're selling their land. And the person who has strength is the one who's buying. And the Torah is saying, don't commit ona, don't oppress the weaker person who's forced to sell their land by buying the land and keeping it litzmitut and keeping it forever, which in the larger context of Parshat Bahar, if you read more of the Psukim, you know, starting from Perak Yud and continue into the cuffs in that section in Perak Kafe, you'll see that it's, you know, we don't want the land to be sold litzmitut forever. It has to be returned on the Yovel because if it's not returned on the Yovel, then that poor person who was forced to sell their land is not going to be able to get their land back. And so by looking at it this way, he says, you know what? It's possible that you don't even have to look at these psukim as talking about una'a in the exact same way that Chazal talked about una'a, where it's overcharging or undercharging, but you could just look at it in the manner in general in the Tanakh of the stronger party, here the buyer, taking advantage of the weaker party, here the seller, and buying the Karka lets me to buying it forever. Now, I don't think you even have to say that, to be honest. You could still say the oppression applies and maybe the person selling is the stronger party because they're setting the sale price and the person buying is the weaker party because they're desperate to get this land, right? But nonetheless, I find Ahuvia's suggestion to be very interesting because he's leaning in, instead of leaning into Chazal's definition of Ona, he's leaning into a Pshat definition that works with the rest of Tanakh. And yet, whether he's right or wrong, I think there's also something to be said for introducing the question of power relations in uh, transactions, right? Who is the weaker party and who is the stronger party? Well, it's very easy to say, okay, I got it. When you give me an example of a gear, the gear is the weaker party, right? A gear toshav would be a weaker party. When you give me an example of an uni, weaker party. You give me an example of a Yatom or an almana, weaker party. But in regular transactions, who's the stronger party and who's the weaker party? Might be that the person who's selling is forced to sell because they need the money so badly. 
might be that the person who's buying is so desperate to get something. So they're the weaker party. It's not so easy to see. So hopefully from these three perspectives on how to mine the gap between the Chumash and Chazal, what we see is the first answer, still a lot to say to do ona'a on karkaot and don't think about what's wrong just based on what the consequences are. Because yes, it's true, you only have to return the money or you only void the transaction in a case of metaltalin with ona'a, but it's still usher to do ona'a when it comes to karka. That's the Rabban. A second explanation of actually what we might be looking at is that karka in the time of the chumish is really no different from metaltalin in the sense that you need to, you have a set price. And if you do, if you overcharge or undercharge for that matter, you're really doing something problematic. It's not like things were sold all the time like that. And the price for the land was very clear. But when it comes to the time of Chazal, maybe it's a little bit more like a pearl. Maybe it's a little bit more like a safer Torah. Maybe it's a situation where the price can fluctuate in such a deep way, meaning maybe based on what people want to do with it, maybe based on just the fact that it is such a free market in that regard, that things actually change and thinking about how to make sure that the morality is kept in this new financial situation or that people are not hampered from doing proper business in this new situation. Or this third approach that perhaps what the Chumash is giving us is part of a big Tanakhic perspective on you shouldn't have a stronger party take advantage of a weaker party. And that for Chazal, that becomes a conversation about people who are uh, doing ona'a in terms of fraud and defrauding within a financial transaction. But perhaps in the Chumash itself, it's actually just talking about buying the land, let's me too, it's buying it forever. Regardless of which one you choose as the way to understand the difference or the way to mine the gap between the two of them, what I will say is I really love ending on We should not be oppressing uh, people who are in a weak position because we ourselves were people who were in a weak position. We came into Mitzrayim as the new kids and eventually we were treated like the outsiders. And to be able to be mindful of that and the way that Pasuk Yud Zayin ends, that we should always fear Hashem because we know when we're mistreating people and we know when they're treating them right, we're treating them right. So I hope that inspires you to have a Chag Kasher in all the meanings of Kasher. Be well.